This is Ken Roberts inviting you to listen to another adventure of Casey, crime photographer. Ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Our adventure for tonight, Snowball. Night, about half past ten. A sporty little blue sedan makes a two-wide turn out of a quiet residential street and weaves crazily toward a main thoroughfare in a police prowl car that has been idling along. Look at that, Stutz. I see it, Ryan. We'll stop that little blue wagon quick. Guy driver must be lit to the rafters. Even money, there's a dame behind that wheel. When a gal tanks up those fancy cocktails. We'll soon see. Pull up there. Let's pull up, you. You win, Ryan. It's a guy. I wasn't speeding. I didn't pass that red light. You'd have no chance to, brother. You're under arrest for drunken driving. What do you mean, drunken driving? It was sober as a judge. We can see how sober you are. And smell. Well, I admit I had a few scotches. Let's see your license and car registration. Well, look, I... I wasn't so wrong either, Ryan. There's a dame in this back seat. Covered up with a blanket. What do you mean, a dame? Forget about your girlfriend, mister? I didn't have... You are drunk. Uh The dame's passed out, Stutzy? Yeah, out cold. Hey, she is cold. Huh? Ryan, this woman's dead. Dead? Look at the bruises on her neck. I think she's been strangled. I I, I never saw that woman before. I never saw that woman before! I never saw that woman before, Captain. I never saw that woman... I'll talk to you in just a minute, mister. And while Captain Logan's busy, I'll take your picture, chum. Doc, what's your verdict? Oh, this woman's been dead about an hour, maybe a little more. I'd say she was strangled about 9.30. Strangler must have had an easy time of it, Doc. That dead gal can't weigh over 100 pounds. Expensive clothes she has on, Casey. I wouldn't know about that, Annie. You think she was killed in this car, Doc, or put here after she was dead? Uh, I don't know, Captain. Oh, Sergeant, now that Doc's finished, see if you can find any identification on her. Okay, sir. I swear I had nothing to do with that woman's death, Captain. I've I... heard their story, mister. Now I'll listen to yours. Now, according to your driver's license, your name is Rasco. Huh? Yes, George P. Rasco. I'm a respectable businessman. The car man. numbers and the registration you hand to these arresting officers are not those of this car you're driving. Well, that's the reason. That, that's what happened. My car's the same make, the same model, the same color as this. When I left the party, I made a mistake and got in the wrong car. Now tell me about the party you left. Well, it was at the Crofts Hall Apartments. A friend of mine lives there, Bob Willis. He invited a bunch of us because his wife is away. What time the... did you leave this Bob Willis apartment at the Crofts Hall? I, uh, uh I, I was drunk, Captain. I don't know. That sounds like the truth. Remember what you did after you left the party? Why, well, yeah. I just went to my car, I guess, to what I thought was my car. I got in and I started to drive home. You and... parked your car near the Crofts Hall Apartments? Yes, when I went into Bob Willis. Hey, you should find it still there. I'll well, certainly look for it, then. The keys for your car wouldn't fit another car. How did you work? I can't that? remember. This car must have been unlocked. Hey, Captain. Hey, yes, Sergeant? The dead woman's wristwatch has Jim to Irene engraved inside. And a tailor's label inside her jacket has made for Mrs. James Royce written on it. Uh-huh. We just got a radio report on the license of this car that uh, seems to clinch your identification, Captain. Yeah? The car is registered in the name of James R. Royce, whose address is 111 Oakland Lane, sir. Mrs. James R. Royce. I huh? never heard of Mrs. James Royce. I David never... Rasco. Officer Ryan, you and your partner take this guy to your precinct station to put him on ice. Yes, sir. I swear, Ryan. Look, I'm a a married man. By my memory. Sergeant, you, Peterson, and Goldberg, go to the Crofts Hall Department, see if you can find the car registered under Rasco's name parked near there, and check his party story at the Willis Apartment. Yes, sir. All this while you, Annie, and I call on the dead woman's husband, Logan. I'd prefer to call on him minus your company, Casey. Mm. You know, this guy's getting antisocial, Annie. He's also rude, but he can't insult us. Not a chance. Come on, pal. We'll help you find out what Mr. James Royce may know about his late wife's murder. This is the place, 111 Oakland Lane. Neat little house. In a lovely neighborhood. Now we'll see if Mr. James Royce is at home. 
Doesn't look as though he is, Logan. No lights showing in the place. Well, it's after 11, Casey. He's probably in bed. All people aren't night owls like ourselves. Yeah, sometimes forget that, Anne. Yeah, we'll soon find out. Oh, that bell should wake him. Now I'll buzz him again. And longer. I hope he isn't home. I hate this kind of a job, breaking the news of a tragedy. Yeah, me too. You and Casey invited yourselves here, Miss Williams. Mm, I know. Hey, take your finger off that bell button, Logan, fast. Oh, what? Ah, smell that, smell. Smell? Here, your nose close to the door jam. It's gas. Yeah, that's cooking gas. Casey. Break the glass panel of this door, Logan. Use your gun button. Uh, hurry up. <laughs> Oh. House must be full of it. I'll reach inside and turn the door latch. I've got it. Uh, kick out those windows, Casey. Get air in here. I'll no. fix these. Okay. I'll find the light switch. No, Annie, no. The switch would make a spark and blow us off. The doorbell didn't set this stuff off. But use my flashlight to see. That gas will be coming from the kitchen stove. Sure, back this way. Here's the kitchen. Oh, that man. Yes, his head in the oven. Turn off those burners, Casey. Oh, I see if he's alive. Yeah. Get that kitchen door open, Annie. Get this gas out of here. Yeah, quick. Where long does it take all of it? How is the guy, Logan? Yeah. Uh, finished. Completely. Uh, Maybe a pull motor. No, nah, not a chance, Miss Williams. <clears throat> guy did a double job on himself. A double job? Yeah, look at this little bottle beside him. <gasps> poison. Yeah. A quick shore poison by the label. Well, you can risk throwing a switch now, Casey. Get us some real lighter here. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's better. Captain Logan, there's a highball glass inside the oven. Yeah, quarter full. Apparently this guy mixed his poison with a little joy juice after he turned on the gas and drank it and slumped down with his face in the open oven. He was thoughtful of the neighbors. He turned off the pilot light before There's he turned on the gas. There's a wallet in his hip pocket. Let's see. There's his driver's license. I imagine he... Yep. Our dead guy seems to have been James R. Royce. The husband of that woman who was found... Uh-huh. Called... Murder and suicide. You know, suicides usually leave farewell notes. Yeah, we'll look around before I phone the tech squad. Captain, here it is. That big photograph of the woman who was strangled? Oh, there's a note on the back of it. Huh? What is it? Printed in red. It was done with that lipstick here on the table where I found the photo. The note's short, but not sweet, Logan. <laughs> uh, I killed her tonight. I find her in my car. Now I'm taking the only way out. No signature. And the note's printed in such big letters, there's no room for a signature. Yeah, that's funny. Printed with a lipstick by a man. Couldn't he write? Couldn't he own a pencil? Well, it's my guess right now that wrong car Mr. Rasco is going to be in the clear, except for a drunken driving chair. Put him up, you people. Casey! What? We've got you covered on all sides. One phony move and we shoot. Who the heck are you? We're police. You're police? Captain Logan, when your face was turned away from this open door, I couldn't see... I'm Patrolman Spencer, 32nd Precinct. I'll be happy to renew our acquaintance, Spencer, after you tell all the cops with you not to start shooting. Well, there's, there's nobody with me, sir. I, uh, I surrounded you by myself. You? <laughs> sir, seems your friend Spencer can stretch himself. <laughs> uh, I guess neighbors heard the racket we made here and phoned the precinct house. Yes, sir. I got the radio report in my prowl car. What's happened here, sir? That guy by the stove. Uh, you can help us find out what's happened, Spencer. Yes, sir. Round up the neighbors for a little question B about Mr. and Mrs. James Royce. No, Captain, I know nothing whatever about Mr. and Mrs. Royce's movements tonight. Oh, I, I can't believe oh, it. I'm sorry I had to shock you with the bad news of what we found, Mrs. Taylor, but I need your help. My help? As the Royce's closest neighbor, I've come to you first. You must have known the couple rather well. Yes. Uh, would you please tell me what you know about them? Well, uh, I... To begin with, did they quarrel? Almost constantly. Jim, um, Mr. Royce, was madly jealous of his wife, Casey. Jealous, huh? And I'm sorry to say she gave him reason. Oh, I don't mean she did anything bad. Irina was simply a pretty, vain little thing who craved masculine attention. But no married woman in this neighborhood has felt really secure since Irina Royce has lived here. You uh, felt insecure, Mrs. Taylor? No, Mr. Casey. I'm a widow. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Taylor, in your opinion, could Royce's jealousy have led him to kill his wife and then himself? I've heard him threaten to do what he did tonight. You have? Many times. So have others. Poor Jim had a violent temper, and he often shouted so everyone this block could hear. Now, what was Royce's job? Where did he work? He was sales manager of the Carlton Judd Manufacturing Company. 
Calvin Judd. It's a first-class firm, Logan. They make electrical equipment. Uh, Casey and I have met uh, Mr. Judd and his wife. What? Have we any? Well, don't you remember? Last year when we covered the opening of that new slum settlement house on Ivy Street, the Judds had to put up most of the money for it. Wait, I place him now. Sure, big, homely, middle-aged woman and a big, handsome, gray-haired man. Uh, yes, I think I know why you didn't forget him, Annie. He made quite a play for you. Don't be silly. He's simply a born ladies' man who's naturally nice to every girl he meets. Mm. I'll call on the Carlton Judd outfit first thing in the morning. Uh, thanks very much, Mrs. Taylor. Not at all. I'll call on some of the other neighbors now. I think they'll tell you substantially what I have, Captain. Logan. Huh? Your cops can call on the other neighbors. We're going to visit Royce's boss, Carlton Judd. Casey. I've just remembered something you've apparently forgotten, Annie. His address. His address? Yes. Carlton Judd and his wife live in the Crofts Hall Apartments. The Crofts Hall? Where Rasco claims he got in the wrong car with the dead body of Mrs. Royce. Mm Mm-hmm. Interested, Logan? Come on. After I get a report from my cops who are checking Rasco's story about that swanky joint, I may want to talk to Mr. Judd. Few, few people have brought me terrible news. I'm inexpressibly shocked, Miss Williams. I'm sorry, Mr. Judd. Yeah. James Royce was more than a valued employee, Mr. Casey. He'd become a personal friend, also his wife. Both of them frequently visited Mrs. Judd and myself in this apartment. Why, I'd expected James here this very night. You expected him tonight? Yes, Captain. He was to bring me a contract he expected to close after office hours. When I returned home an hour ago, I wondered why I didn't find it here. Mr. Judd, you said you returned home an hour ago. Well, how long were you out? Why, most of the evening, Mr. Casey, I attended a movie. Uh, with Mrs. Judd? Uh, no, I went alone. Mrs. Judd isn't home. Uh, yesterday, she left on a motor trip to California. Well, you have servants, of course, who could have let Royce in while you were at the movies. It so happens I'd given the servants a holiday during my wife's absence. Well, then how could Royce get I'd, in? I'd uh, lent poor James a key to this apartment. Royce had a key to yes. the place, huh? I... I simply can't believe he's dead and had his lovely wife... So was she as lovely as she looked, Mr. Judd? Yes. I considered Mrs. Royce to have been an altogether splendid woman. Mm. Well, you knew her. We didn't. Captain, if there's any way I can be of service, please command me. If not, I'd like to be alone. Good night, Miss Williams. But it's really morning, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, nearly uh, one o'clock. What movie did you see tonight, Mr. Judd? Lost Boundaries of the Empire. I walked home from there and took my time. Mm. These apartments are a cinch to get in and out of without being seen. Why do you say that? Uh, Just thinking out loud. Are these apartments soundproof? Unfortunately, no. Mrs. Judd and I are often unpleasantly aware of our neighbors in the adjoining apartment. If they weren't now vacationing in Europe, you'd hear one of their radios blasting out dance music. Any further comments or questions concerning my home, Mr. Casey? No. Good night, Mr. Judd. Good night. I shall hold myself at your service, Captain. Thanks, Mr. Judd. And uh, it has been a privilege to see you again, Miss Williams. You're very nice, Mr. Judd. Good night. Good night. <laughs> nice. Let's walk down the stairs. <laughs> you didn't get much out of it, Mr. Judd, did you, pal? Did you go for that movie alibi of his? You consider that an alibi? Casey, I don't think Mr. Judd knows anything more about those deaths than we've just told him. Because you're a sap for his Prince Charming act. <gasps> Sometimes you talk like a schoolboy and a backward one. Oh. Well, if you ask me, I think Miss Williams is right. Oh, you've fallen for his personality, too. Right? I don't fall for personalities. I think this case will be finally written off as murder and suicide by James Royce and nothing more. Logan, I have a hunch that you're wrong. Cigarette, Ethelbert. Thanks, Casey. On the basis of what you've told me, you haven't any good arguments to suspect this Carlton Judd. Of course he hasn't, Ethelbert. He jumped to a sudden conclusion. I did not jump to any conclusion about Judd, Ann. This thing just isn't simple. Now, for instance, why was that note printed? And with lipstick. 
Well, maybe Mrs. Royce's vanity was the real cause of her husband's jealousy. And Royce used the lipstick as a symbol of that vanity. Go on and ring, you... All right. Blue Note Cafe, Ethelbert speaking, and it's almost closing time, so don't... Oh, Mr. Burke. <laughs> Did he dead? Yeah. Uh, just a minute. It's for either you or Miss Williams, Casey. You you go ahead and take it in. Mm, okay. Hello, Burke. What's that? Who is? Well, we'll, we'll get right over there. What? An unidentified woman has just been found dead outside the Crofts Hall apartment. An unidentified... Outside the... The Crofts Hall? She apparently fell or was thrown from a window in the same building unit where Carlton Judd lived. Has a dead woman been identified yet, Logan? Yes, Casey. She's a servant named Mattie Saunders who worked for a Mr. Robert Willis. Robert Willis? Well, that, that's the man who gave the party where uh, Ralph go. Coincidence, isn't it? Uh, uh, what have you learned about this Mattie Saunders, Logan? Uh, not much, except she was nosy and a tippler. Nosy? Have you talked to Willis yet? Oh, no, I got here only a short time before you did, Miss Williams, and uh, see, uh, Doc hasn't completed his examination of the body. Hmm. Uh, Doc, uh, how are you coming? Give me another minute, Captain. She fell in back of these bushes. Yeah, I guess. Where is the Willis apartment? Up on the top floor. Uh, mm-hmm. You can see its windows up there, all of them wide open. Okay, Captain. Oh, uh, what's the verdict, Doc? That woman's fall was no accident. No? She died between 9.30 and 10 o'clock last evening. Between 9.30 and 10? Yes, Casey. Bone fractures, obviously caused by the fall, occurred a considerable time after the woman was dead. The body was dropped from one of those windows up there to simulate an accident. Definitely, Miss Williams. I'm going up and have a talk with Ron Carrasco's friend, Mr. Robert Willis. Now, wait a minute, Logan. Wait, wait. I think you'll save a lot of time by paying a visit first to the Carlton Judd apartment. Oh, Casey, Mr. Judd's apartment's on the opposite side of this building. Yeah, this Saunders woman couldn't have been tossed out of one of its windows. They don't face this way. Well, the other apartment on the Judd floor faces this way. And Judd told us the tenants are in Europe. So? Logan, didn't you ever make a snowball and roll it down a hill? You know how it picks up more snow? It gets bigger and bigger until it finally gets out of control? A murder can be like that. One killing can lead to another. I think the explanation will be found in Carlton Judd's apartment. Logan, are you going up there with me, or shall I go alone? Captain, I... I've been asleep for some time. I can't see what possible excuse you have for waking me at this hour. All I know about this unfortunate Saunders woman is that she was employed by a fellow tenant here. Why bother me? It was Casey's idea that we disturb you, Mr. Judd. I'm here in the role of uh, innocent bystander. And so am I. Well, Mr. Casey? I see there's unmelted ice in this highball glass on your table. I... Say, you couldn't have been asleep very long. Uh, you had too much on your mind to make sleep possible. Hmm? You brought me very disturbing news earlier tonight. Uh, I'm going to disturb you further by telling you a theory I have about the death of Mrs. Royce and her husband. What, uh, what is this theory? James you're... Royce wasn't the only person who was jealous. Mrs. Royce was strangled to death here in your apartment. You're mad. Mm-hmm. The killer carried the body downstairs to the Royce car and was seen by this maid, Mattie Saunders, who had the reputation of being nosy. Go on. Thank you. I think it was the killer's intention to drive the Royce car containing the body to some out-of-the-way place and wreck it. But the snowball of murder was rolling. It had been picked up Mattie Saunders, who mustn't be allowed to tell what she'd seen. She was known as a tippler, so the killer probably found it very easy to persuade her to come up to his apartment for a drink. And when she reached there, she was hit on the head. Mr. Casey... Let me finish, Mr. Judd. When the killer found the Royce car gone, he realized the body of Mrs. Royce was sure to be discovered and traced back to the Crofts Hall, where inquiry would naturally lead to the apartment of Royce's employer. But the killer had to roll the snowball further. Royce must be made to appear the murderer of his wife, and that could only be accomplished by Royce's death. 
So your killer arranged Royce's apparent suicide? Yes. But he still had a problem. Matty Saunders' body had to be disposed of, pushing it from a window in the unoccupied apartment next door, which was directly under the one where she had worked, seemed an easy solution. Well, that's my case, Mr. Judge. It, uh, it's a good case. Such a good case that I shan't attempt to deny my guilt. Would you admit? Yes, Captain. I am the killer. Casey! Carlton Judd, I place you under arrest. Oh, wait a minute. Hold it, Logan. Hold it. Mr. Judd hasn't murdered anyone. Hasn't? What? Mr. Casey, I've just confessed. Mr. Judd, where's your wife? My wife? Uh, She's not here. She left for California yesterday. That's what she told you. I swear. When we were here a few hours ago, this big ashtray was clean and empty. Now it's full of cigarette butts. I... You don't leave lipstick stains on cigarettes, do you, Mr. Judd? Is Mrs. Judd still in this apartment? Or did she go back to her hiding place next door? I'm here. Alice. Mrs. Judd. I can't let you take the blame for what I've done, Carl. Take me to jail, Captain. You killed... Yes. No, no, Alice. She's lying, Captain. It was I. Thanks, Carl. But it's no use. Alice. Try to forgive me, if you can. Mr. Casey, when you came here before, it was plain to me that you suspected my husband. I was listening in the apartment next door. It was your obvious suspicion of him that overcame the madness that has possessed me for a long time. The insane jealousy that tonight reached its climax. For his protection, I came to him after you had gone and told him about the the horrible things I'd done. When we heard you at the door again, I wanted to give myself up and get it over. But he wouldn't let me. He hoped to save me. Don't blame him for that. Don't blame him for anything. He's a fine man. I know. Now, there's a whole lot I don't know when I... Take it easy, Logan. You'll get the full story later. This Mrs. Judd gave her husband the idea she was going to California so she could spy on him, Casey, and uh, maybe catch him pulling something? Yeah, Ethel Byrne. For a long time, she'd been jealous of her husband. Huh? And she convinced herself that he liked Mrs. Royce much too well. Well, Mrs. Judd hid herself in that empty apartment with her ear to the wall and her eye to the keyhole. And last night, after Royce got those contracts he was supposed to take to Mr. Judd, he had a violent headache. And he sent his wife with him to Judd's apartment instead. Mrs. Royce went there with him and let herself in with a key her husband had given her for just that purpose. And Mrs. Judd jumped to the worst possible conclusion, flew into an insane rage, and never gave Mrs. Royce the slightest opportunity to explain. She simply burst into the room and choked her to death. You know what happened from then on. Yeah, the snowball rolled. What made you finally suspect Mrs. Judd instead of her husband, Casey? That lipstick she used in that suicide setup? No, that wasn't the main thing that made Mr. Judd a difficult suspect in Casey's theory. No, no, it wasn't any. Well, what was? You see, the Judd Manufacturing Company makes electrical equipment. After I really started to think, I couldn't see a guy who was familiar with electricity rigging a phony suicide setup with gas. Seems Judge Judd would have would have known that a faulty doorbell or a switch could throw a spark that'd blast the house to pieces and wreck the whole setup that he'd taken so much pains to leave. I see. Miss Williams, this uh, this Casey's a clever guy. Mm. Yes, Ethelbert, I agree with you. Hmm. <laughs> Come on, Annie. Say something nice for a change. <laughs> You're quite a guy, Casey. Oh. Thanks, kid. What a guy you'd be if you only had Mr. Judd's lovely manners and charm. <clears throat> Ethelbert, I'm almost sorry I didn't frame that mug. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs> 